international business machines, IBM, developed a product that defined an entire segment, capturing an incredible 94% of market share before technological progress made it obsolete. There was no office of any worth that did not have several of these machines. In 1981, IBM introduced the personal computer, but this is not the product of which I speak. The IBM PC only ever captured about 80% of the market share and declined rapidly over the course of the following years. No, 20 years earlier, in 1961, IBM introduced an iconic product, the IBM Selectric, a typewriter that replaced the type bar with a type ball that would rotate to the correct character almost instantaneously. Unlike conventional typewriters, the ball of this electric typewriter could be easily swapped with a ball of a different font. Beyond being an excellent typewriter, the Selectric also interfaced with early computers to serve as a printer. If you've never seen one of these marbles, I've put links on the show notes to IBM's historical webpage and also to the opening credits of the 1970s British science fiction television series called UFO that established its futuristic bona fides in the opening credits by showing a Selectric printing out an important message. The system was excellent, but not perfect, and the Selectric would occasionally print out an incorrect character when used as a printer. These typographical errors were caused by noise in the transmission line between the computer and the Selectric. Indeed, communication between computers, often conducted through phone lines, was plagued with noise, and this noise obscuring the data signal set a limit on the amount of information that could be transferred. This was a substantial problem for IBM, whose business was predicated on transmission of data. I'm Josh Young, and this is Playing Odd, a podcast about complexity and information in the natural world. Episode 3, The Structure of Noise. In the 1950s and early 1960s, IBM sought to address the noise problem by improving the components used in the system, by increasing the strength or amplitude of the data signal, and by introducing low-pass signal filters. A low-pass filter does exactly what you would think. It lets lower frequencies pass through while removing higher frequency signals from the transmission line. Since data were generally passed in lower frequency signals, the higher frequencies tended to disproportionately represent noise. This approach yielded some initial benefits, but despite impressive engineering, IBM simply could not get the noise out of the system. A different approach was needed, and for this, IBM brought on a Polish polymath, Benoit Mandelbrot. Born in Warsaw, Mandelbrot fled to Paris in 1936 on the eve of the Second World War. As a Jew in Nazi-occupied France, Mandelbrot lived in fear of denunciation by a rival and arrest by Nazis, as had happened to a close friend of his, Zina Morange. Paralleling Albert Einstein, another Jew who had fled from the Nazis, Mandelbrot joined the faculty at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, where he was sponsored by John von Neumann. In 1958, having been recruited by IBM at the Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, New York, Mandelbrot was assigned to the problem of intractable noise in computer communication. Eschewing the approaches that IBM engineers had taken to suppress noise, Mandelbrot recognized the noise in the signal as something more intrinsic. His insight was to view the noise over different scales of time. To understand this great contribution, we need to see noise as something visual. Let's imagine a graph in which the y-axis is the amplitude of the signal and the x-axis is time. I deal with graphs like this all the time in recording this podcast, in which my voice modulates the height along the y-axis and time proceeds in seconds along the x-axis. But even when I do not speak, there's some bumpiness in the graph that forms. Some of this bumpiness arises from sounds outside of my recording studio. Some of the bumpiness 
arises from random electromagnetic fluctuations in the cable between my microphone and preamplifier and between the preamplifier and my computer. Mandelbrot's great insight was to compare the bumpiness of the signal, that is to say, the noise, over different scales of time. He found that whether the scale of the x-axis was large or small units of time, the graph of the noise looked the same. He referred to this property as self-similarity, in my example, across time. But let's imagine this a different way. Imagine that we capture 10 minutes of random noise. Regardless of the degree to which we zoom in on this plot, the pattern of the noise will look essentially the same, although, of course, not identical. In fact, if we were presented with a graph of the noise with an unlabeled x-axis or time axis, we would not be able to surmise whether we were looking at 10 minutes of data, 10 seconds, or 10 milliseconds. This self-similarity over scale is a fundamental characteristic of what became known as fractal geometry. A fractal is a shape that looks similar regardless of how much magnification is employed in its observation. Self-similarity is a feature of many biological systems. Think of the branches of a tree. If one were to make a line drawing of the branches, it would be impossible to tell whether the drawing were of branches coming off of a trunk or of twigs coming off of a smaller branch. The pattern, although not identical, is roughly the same. The fractal nature of many biological structures is observed in the bronchioles of the lungs, the vascular branching of blood vessels in the body, and perhaps most iconically in the beautiful spirals of Romanesque broccoli, a picture of which I've included in the show notes. Changes in the range of scales over which a biological system is self-similar may themselves be indicators of pathology, and this is the subject of some of my own work. Mandelbrot showed us that fractal geometry, geometry demonstrating self-similarity over a range of scales, can be used to describe natural phenomena like noise, coastlines, mountain ranges, and many biological systems. But it is also possible to take the opposite approach. That is, to write a simple set of rules that will create a pattern that looks intrinsically biological. The example that I will give is not so much of a biological pattern as of a recognizably natural one, but it is a pattern that lends itself to an experiment that you can perform with ordinary household items. For this experiment, you will initially need four matches or other similarly shaped objects. Let's line up three of those objects, three of the matches, into a line that is three matches long. Now, I'm going to introduce a rule. The rule is that the middle one-third of the line, that's to say the middle match that makes up the middle one-third of the line, is going to be replaced by two matches. Now, we're not going to move the match on either side of that middle match. So in order to keep all the matches connected, the two matches that are now in the middle must be tented up to form a point. Now we have four matches, the ones on either side of the middle being unchanged from the original pattern, and the two matches in the center that form a point. So far, so good? Okay, now we're going to do the same process with the same set of rules, but rather than starting out with a line of three matches, we're going to start out with a triangle. Each of the sides of the triangle is composed of three matches, to make a line just like the one we started out with. Therefore, this triangle as a whole will be composed of nine matches, three for each side. This looks like an entirely unremarkable equilateral triangle. We're now going to introduce the same rule. The middle match of each side is replaced by two matches forming a point. If we do this properly, we will have transformed our triangle into a six-pointed star. If you've gotten this far, bravo, you're almost done with the experiment. The next part we're going to do in our imagination, unless you're really keen on this project, each sides of the star can be thought of as representing three small segments or three mini matches. We are going to, in our imagination, replace the middle third of each of these two small segments, again, forming another point, a smaller point. 
If we continue to apply this rule of replacement of the center third of each edge with two sections making a point, we will produce, ultimately, an outline that looks very much like a snowflake. The pattern we have made is intrinsically fractal. I say this because we can zoom in on the edges at any scale of the pattern and it will look the same. Indeed, drawing out the pattern of part of one of the sides of the snowflake, it would be impossible for us to guess at which scale we are viewing it because at all scales, the outline looks the same. What have we done here? We've taken an extremely simple rule, that of the substitution of the center third of each edge, and used it to produce a pattern of essentially infinite intricacy. A rule that is applied and then reapplied is referred to as being iterative. Iteration is itself an example of a sort of compression. We did not have to create an instruction set that described the complicated outline of the snowflake. We only had to establish a rule and then iterate it. The instruction set is very simple the same sort of iterative strategy is employed in genetic expression and can generate really very complicated structures. Could iteration be the secret to generating our fantastically complicated brain? To answer that question, let's compare our snowflake to an actual snowflake. If all snowflakes grew by following one simple rule, they would all be identical. Yet the adage that every snowflake is different turns out to be largely true. From where do these differences arise? As the snowflake is buffeted in its fall to earth, the likelihood of an ice crystal forming is not equal on all of its edges at the same time. These random outside influences, what we think of as noise, affect the final shape of the snowflake. And since no two snowflakes encounter exactly the same number of molecules of water in exactly the same orientation at the same time, the final structure of each snowflake is indeed slightly different. Our iterative rule to construct our beautiful and perfect snowflake is also the greatest problem with this methodology. Because we have a fixed rule, the process of producing the snowflake is what we refer to as determinative. That is to say, we know what the pattern will be because of the rule that is applied. And the outcome must necessarily be the same or else we've made some error in our calculation. There are biological structures that can function perfectly well even if their structure is determinative. It's unlikely that the pattern of veins on a leaf are so important that they cannot all be the same. This is patently untrue of the brain. The connections in the brain are neither random nor entirely determinative because were they so, each of us would have an identical brain and indeed each portion of our brain would be identical to every other portion. Amongst other motifs, like the importance of exogenous information, noise will appear several times over these podcasts and will prove itself not always to be an impediment to construction, but sometimes a very element of construction itself. Iterative construction will play a role in our unfolding story, but as a bit part and not as the main character. Ours is a story about information and how much information can be contained in an infinitely branching pattern if the pattern itself is created by one simple rule. In order to answer this question, we need to define precisely what we mean by information. And this will be the subject of next week's program. In this episode, we learned about self-similarity in natural systems. We learned that a simple rule, when repeated, can produce a pattern of infinite intricacy. We observed that rule-based construction of a pattern always yields the same result, and we named this ultimate predictability as determinative. Finally, we drew a distinction between structures that are intricate and structures that are information-laden, although we have yet to define information. I want to thank you, kind listener, for taking this journey through complexity with me. A bibliography for this episode, along with links to additional material, can be found at playingodd.com. I hope this program will serve as an opening to a broader conversation. Please write to me with your questions or comments 
at josh at playingodd.com. I look forward to spending time with you next week. I'm Josh Young.